And welcome back to Watches Live. Thank you for joining me this Tuesday evening on the only show that we film on the Reviews Channel. I've got a live audience streaming in from around the world, and I want to thank everyone who continues to enter our Oris Arctic Audi Sport GMT raffle. By the way, if you're watching this recorded, there will be a link in the description by which you can enter our raffle. Score yourself some points and waiting in the raffle, because it's not purely objective, by participating in our social media through that link. All right, tonight, great stuff. Russell996, you're first off the dock. Jose Diaz, Andrew Montsuravai, Mike M, Tom P, Andrew ST12, and Watt family. Welcome, guys. Let's jump straight in. I promised you AP. Let's lead off with AP. We'll start with A. We'll end with Z. This is a watch that, strictly speaking, is no longer made. Now, from 2012 to 2016, this was the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Chronograph. This is stainless steel, 41 millimeters, and you'll note real screw-down pushers. There was a reprofiling of the dial in 2017, the 20th anniversary of the Royal Oak Chronograph. What they did was they emphasized the chronograph registers at the expense of constant seconds. There were some detailed changes to the dial, the script, the date window, and the indices, but the real changes were to the register. The easily missed change was to the crowns. I actually prefer this watch for a very specific reason. These are real screwdowns. Crowns. On the 2017 to present watch, the 26331, this is the 26320, you actually have screw downs. Why does this matter? Because at 50 meters water resistant, this watch is the bare minimum of what I consider sufficient for swimming. With screw downs, I feel reasonably secure. With push downs that look like screw downs, I don't feel that way. So if you're going to swim with a Royal Oak Chronograph, not an offshore, I recommend going with the 2012 to 2016 26320. And heck, why not get it in a summery steel with silver dial? Okay. Friends join in from around the world. Abu Sadiq, Dave the Watch Guy, Jeffrey B, Blue Shirt Buddha. Welcome, dudes. Okay, so you want to see a quick wrist shot there. I've always said that 41 wears like a 42 or a 43, by the way. Uh, those of you who might be interested, and someone always asks, this is my Swatch System 51 System Frog, a 33rd birthday present from my mom, and a watch I love to wear. Believe it or not, this is one of three green watches I have on the table tonight, and two of them are luxury. Okay, back to the AP. 41 with the AP wears like a 43, and I'm not going to lie, it's easier to wear an offshore on the diver strap than it is on my 16-centimeter wrist to wear this 41 on a bracelet. You get what you pay for. It looks the business and it's built like it. it. Probably takes about nine hours to finish all components of the case and bracelet, but rest assured, it's a big piece of wrist real estate. If you got a smaller wrist than mine, you want to go with a 39 or one of the older 36.5s. Okay. From A to B and why not, a brand I actually love, and it's right up there with Longa and Zenith and JLC for me, but Blanc Pomp, possibly the most underrated of the Swatch Group brands next to Mido. They're different ends of the economic spectrum in Swatch, but both have underrated products in their segment. This is the Bathyscaphe. Now, in 2013, the 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe joined the lineup as a more stripped down, somewhat smaller counterpart to the reference 5015. Now, this is the reference 5000 in black ceramic. A couple of things. First, it's 13.9 millimeters thick compared to 15.5 for the standard 50 fathoms, and it's 43 millimeters in diameter, less than 50 millimeters lug to lug. And in ceramic, it wears feather light. It's also got a sleek stealth bomber look to it with the ceramic bezel rather than sapphire, ceramic case, the black matte dial, and this sensational sailcloth strap. I love the look and the feel of this watch. Is it a bit more stark than my style? Yes. But if I were considering a 50 Fathoms, I would absolutely have to consider this watch part of the equation. Now, here's where I think Blancpain has it all over Audemars Piguet. You can pay a premium and get an AP offshore diver, or you can pay less 
possibly even a lot less if you're buying pre-owned, and get this bathyscaph with a five-day power reserve, free-sprung balance, silicon hairspring, and quite frankly, a level of finish about this caliber 1315 that is far higher than what you'll get on Audemars Piguet's 3120 in the Royal Oak Offshore Diver. You don't have to ask me twice which one I would take. I would take the Blancpain, but I have to remind you, these watches are an absolute bargain pre-owned to the point that you can pick up a watch like this for less than the price of some of the pre-owned marked up Rolex Submariners in steel, and that is a steal in every sense of the word. All right, Cull Obsidian, I can see Todd, JBO Surf, longtime viewer, and Mark S. Tim, do any of the Cadwallader Partners Associates hit you up for watch information? This is an interesting question because it touches on whether people from my previous lives have discovered me on the internet. And the answer is yes. I have actually received notes from them to the effect of, what the hell? I didn't realize you were doing this. People from my Navy days suddenly want to talk to me about watches because now they're, you know, making Mission Commander and they're looking at 04 and now they're trying to get promotions. They want to have like upscale aviator style watches now that they're looking at desk jobs. All sorts of crazy stuff. So their careers have continued. I've just shifted gears and it's weird. It's like the Seinfeld world's colliding when I hear from those old law and Navy people here. Okay, quick. What is different about Chopard from Patek, Vacheron, Langa, and AP? You never talk about the brand. That's what's different. The quality is there and it always has been. But Chopard, since the debut of the LUC Tech Twists in 2008, has always done high horology and a slightly more expressive, even somewhat, I would say, exuberant, postmodern, and unabashedly fun fashion. Now, this is the Chopard LUC Tech Twist. It's a model in pink gold with a blue dial, and as you can see, all applied rose gold Arabic numerals that debuted in 2008 as one of 250 pieces. Now it has a 65 hour manufacture micro rotor automatic movement inside. That's the caliber 96T with a 22 carat gold, white gold micro rotor, beautifully executed, adjusted in a chronometer like five positions. I'm gonna clean off my own fingerprints and I do regret the obstruction, but you're gonna find that there's nothing that you can find in the AP catalog that offers a clean alternative to this. This is sensational. This is almost what I imagine a good Audemars Piguet dress watch would look like. Irreverent, fun, free-spirited, no signs or strains of conservatism. The only tradition is the adherence to the best traditions of watch finish and watch making. But you'll even note that the open aperture that contains the sub-seconds and the date is a little bit offbeat in that it is robustly asymmetrical. I love that you can see the base plate of the movement. I love that it uses color. I love that it has layers and that it looks like nothing else in the industry. And I love that they kicked the crown all the way down to four o'clock. Even the case profile is individualist. 41 millimeters, a great looking watch, and from one of the truly great manufacturers in modern Swiss horology, Chopard, for whatever reason, doesn't get the love they're great watches to buy pre-owned, and I have to say, there is no sacrifice. If AP had a dress watch like this, it would be a sensation. From Chopard, the knowing will give their nods and glances, but the hype, the mainstream, those who run with the pack, they're never going to acknowledge. And you know what? Who needs them? This watch is incredible. Okay, Amro, always keeping me on track, asking when are we going to see the Breitling Transocean Perpetual Calendar? Right now. Now, here's a watch you can pick up for $26,000 pre-owned. A lot of money, yes. But back in 2014, I had a Breitling boutique employee try to convince me to pay $57,700 for this limited edition of 25 because that was the MSRP. Now, if you walk into a Breitling boutique and you pay 57 dollars list without batting an eye, I would love to know what it's like to have a Gazprom sinecure and what's it like to roll with Putin. For everyone else, this is a watch to buy pre-owned because it is objectively an excellent watch. It just costs way too much at 57.7. For half price, suddenly we're in the game. 25 pieces. This is a true Breitling perpetual calendar, which is to say it's not their 1461 that needs to be adjusted every four years, like the caliber 29. Well, actually, this is caliber 29. 
39 is going to be your 1461. The watch right here is 43 millimeters. Caliber 29, the rarely seen combination of a DD perpetual calendar module and a 2892A2 chronometer base. It's a chronometer, it's a perpetual calendar, it's a versatile and handsome dress watch from Breitling with a sports watch case profile and an impressive wrist stance. This is a watch that represents the kind of direction I'd like to see Breitling take with all around watches. The question is, why couldn't this watch be executed in titanium or steel with a price of around 20,000 rather than 57.7? For that matter, why can't we get this movement in something like a Navitimer or a Super Ocean? Because frankly, those are the watches that Breitling collectors buy. Does a perpetual calendar dive watch make sense? Not really, but it's fun because we mostly wear our dive watches to the office. This watch is the ultimate statement piece. If you want an alternative to AP, Hublot, the heavy hitters in the oversized complication game, again, this is one to buy pre-owned, but what a rush pre-owned. Evening from Scotland, Richard Atkinson joining us. I can see KMO Ahmed joining us and signing in. Burning, Mr. B, Tim, great show. And I can see Amro, uh, Tangier from Morocco. Okay, guys, watch show to welcome aboard. Ziggy, thank you so much for joining us. And Simon Holt, a customer and a friend of the brand. Okay, so we've done A, we've done B, we've done a little bit of C. Well, speaking of C, how about a watch that literally appropriates the image of the high seas. This is the exquisite 500 piece stainless steel white gold bezel, flinke lacquer dial and bezel, Ulysse Snorden Marine Diver Aqua Perpetual. This is a watch that combines exactly what we just discussed, a perpetual calendar in a dive watch. In 2003, this thing was awesome and it remains just as imposing 15 years later. A combination of the Marine Diver case in brush steel, a white gold bezel with a enamel, excuse me, I should say an enamel style lacquered inlay. Excuse me, my cameraman, I hope you feel better. I can see he's coughing back there. We care about our crew. And you'll note that the dial itself features a flinke base, which is lacquer over a stamped guilloche style underlay. So a sensational piece, a sports watch, 200 meters water resistant with a fairly gorgeous display case back for a workman like UN modified La Magna base automatic. Now it's the perpetual calendar system that really deserves the shout out because this is the Ludwig Oxlund system. First of all, tons of color, a chronometer, a gorgeous watch that you can wear full time, but this is a perpetual calendar system that you can adjust in both directions. And I love that because there is no hazard to the movement. If you've ever used the IWC system or you've heard horror stories of people adjusting two, three months past the current date, not only can you not accidentally do this with that watch, or do that with this watch, but you can actually correct the watch in the year 2100 when every other perpetual calendar system has to go back to the factory for an adjustment. A sensational piece, and with 500 made, I have to say, remarkably, you see very few of them. Collectors tend to buy and hold. Let me show you how it looks on the wrist. Now, it uses a fascinating hybrid titanium and rubber strap, which is to say, the strap itself features these double hinged titanium links. So even though it's broad across the wrist, it is easy to wear. 43 millimeters on a 16 centimeter wrist. It has a unique articulated system that makes it absolutely comfortable and a perfect fit no matter your wrist size. This was one of the great Ulysse Norden watches of the Ralph Schneider and Patrick Hoffman era. This was one of the great Ludwig Oxlund perpetual calendars, and one of the timepieces we look back on pre-carrying ownership and really wish the company would revisit. This is just gorgeous. And on top of all that, steel case, white gold bezel, flinke lacquer dial, and bezel base, super. One of my favorites on the table. Okay, Fjord Prefix saying, perpetual calendar and a dive watch, why not? Just throw in a minute repeater. Hey, They've already got alarms on divers. Let's be honest about how we wear our dive watches. I would wear this exactly the same way I would wear this all the time in my office. The number of times in my life I've gone diving. I can't remember one. I, I don't think I've ever worn an aquatic rated watch below a depth of three feet when I was trying to fake my swim stroke to pass my Navy second class swimming test. I did a really lame breaststroke while wearing my SMP 300 and that was the extent of that 300 meter divers aquatic experience. 
All that said, let's revisit the SMP 300 because it's one of Omega's all time best. We've got two Omega divers, three Seamasters on the table tonight that are quite special. Let's start with the SMP 300. Now, in 2012, the classic Bond style Seamaster was restyled with a lacquer blue dial, a ceramic bezel, and the latest tri level coaxial in the caliber. 2500, which is to say this is one of the latest pre-2018 versions of the SMP 300. It still wears easy. There have been upgrades. Let's start with the most basic. My version of this watch features a bracelet that's sized with pins and sleeves. This one uses screws. If you look at the profile of the bracelet off-center, you can see that the newer versions feature a more squared off profile to the edge of the bracelet. The original had a more rounded profile that was a halfway house between a dress watch bracelet and a sports watch bracelet. It was a product of the 90s. This feels more contemporary. Okay, dial and bezel. The bezel post-2012 is ceramic with liquid metal inserts to keep the numerals and indices permabonded to the blue ceramic. And the dial briefly lost the famed Omega Waves. This is a cleaner gloss lacquer. Some favor the original, some favor this. This, all told, is a far more premium watch, especially when you consider that the Omega logo and the indices on this one are applied rather than the printed dial of mine. I love mine, but I have to admit this is objectively better. Question from Langmac, is that an AP15400 on the table? No, it's the 26320. I'll show you real quick since you're just joining us. We got a quick shot of the AP chrono that opened the frame. 41 millimeters silver dial this is the 2012 to 2016 model. Still lovable. And of course, I mentioned this wear is big. Think of it as a 43, not a 41. Now back to Omega. Here's a watch from the very beginning of the SMP300 family. In 1993, the Seamaster was redesigned, and this was the flagship. Short of the Torbion, back in the early 90s, this was the flagship of the entire Omega collection. This is the Seamaster Professional Diver 300 Chrono in tritone. That's right. If you look at this bracelet, you can see it clearly. The intermediate links down their center are tantalum. They're flanked by rose gold, and then the bracelet primary links are made of titanium. So it's titanium, it's tantalum, and it's rose gold. All together, take a look at the difference between the case band and the bezel. You can see that the case band is distinctly gray, whereas the bezel below the rose gold, below the rose gold, the bezel itself is this blue-gray slate, almost like gunmetal. That's tantalum. This watch combined all three with the original Omega Wave blue dial. And you'll note this is an authentic tritium fade because this is one of the earliest examples from the early 90s. A watch 41 millimeters that's got a lot more presence than that. Now, I will say it wears like a steel watch because the lightness of the titanium is canceled out by the tantalum and the gold. What I can say about this watch is if the standard SMP 300 diver is a Bond watch. This feels like a Bond villain's watch. This is like something Largo from Thunderball would wear. Outrageous, exuberant, flamboyant, in your face. This is a watch designed for the bad guy in a James Bond movie. And I've got to say, I'm absolutely loving it. Pre-coaxial too. Tough as a tank. Powered by the 1164, which is basically an Omega modified chronometer 7750. So literally anyone can work on it. Okay, comments about titanium and tantalum. Mark S., isn't that a mixed message? Heavy and light metals. The whole idea of a luxury mechanical watch, a 40 year obsolete product that costs more than your phone, a quartz watch, a reliable time teller. That's the irony, that we pay money for something obsolete, and not just money, a lot of money, and we romanticize it, and we smile, and we thank Terry Stern for agreeing to sell us that $600,000 minute repeater. Thank you for letting me buy that piece on application, your greatness. It is an ironic business in which we find ourselves. So yes, mixed metals, light and heavy, I love it. It's a contradiction. As a writer, the irony suits me. Now, I will say, 
El Primero, we had it mentioned in the chat box. Let's jump. I'm not going to end on this Zenith. I'm going to save my heavy hitter, my big gun from Zenith. But this is the quirkiest Zenith of the modern era. In 2010, post Terry Natoff, Zenith got a brand wide reboot by now Rolex director general Jean Frederic Dufour, and he rebooted the whole collection, sweeping out the excess of the 2000s. This was the weirdest watch he launched. A constantly running chrono. Let me start this one up. I need to wind it and show you how you cannot stop the chronograph on the retro timer. You can only reset it. What does that mean? Well, effectively, you can use the reset system, the flyback, as hacking seconds. Set the hour, set the minute precisely, and then synchronize the seconds with the chronograph. It's a 30-minute chronograph. There's a little hash at eight minutes, and the leading theory now eight years old, is that one of the designers of the watch liked a particular type of pasta that took exactly eight minutes to cook. There is a decalque technique on the dial that makes it look like carbon fiber. So you get that carbon fiber deck depth and texture, and you get the carbon fiber deck look, but it doesn't have the tendency of carbon fiber to degrade over time in UV. Appliques for the indices, you'll note this is a very stripped down El Primero. It even features a blacked out minimalist 4055 movement, a movement only ever used in this watch. There were two versions of the retro timer. One was steel with a silver dial and a full bracelet. This, which is probably the better known of the two, is black DLC 42 millimeters in steel with a rubber bracelet and a double deployment trigger actuated clasp. How many of these were made? Well, my research confirmed by Zenith is that about 500 to 1,000 were made, and I believe the split was roughly 500-500 of each of the two variants. So this is an incredibly rare modern El Primero, not limited edition, but limited production, a watch with incredible presence on the wrist, a singular face, and once again, a rare model, an exclusive movement, and one of the only El Primeros that you can actually synchronize to a reference time. The new DeFi 21 has a hacking seconds. This has a zero reset flyback. They're both quirky, but this one is discontinued. And frankly, I like this one better. And Amro was asking for the other Zenith. Not until the end. I'm going to end with that one. Let's jump back to the bees, the killer bees for a second. We showed Blancpain, and now we're going with Buy Retro. Technically not a bee brand, but a G brand, Gerald Genta. Now, there's a lot of confusion about the Gerald Genta watches because... He left the brand during the mid-1990s. By 1996, he was completely out, meaning the company that bore his name had no formal relationship with him. And that's to say that a lot of these watches are worthwhile in their own right because they represent the exuberance and blue sky imagination and willingness to risk that younger unestablished designers let loose on the company's mainstream lines. So this is actually a remarkably fresh design, and I'm going to show you how it works, because it is a bi-retrograde jump hour, and you get your money's worth with these mid-90s to late 2000s Gentas. Bulgari bought the brand in the 2000s, and in 2010 announced that all previous Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth watches, they were made out of the same Le Sentier factory, would be subsumed into the Bulgari line. That's why you now have the Bulgari Octo, a design inherited from Genta. Well, this watch right here is an absolutely sensational Retrograde minute, retrograde date, jump hour, and it had two patents involved, one of which allows you to set the retrograde backwards and forwards without damaging the system, and the other of which makes the jump hour more shock resistant so you can't accidentally jump the hour if the watch should take a knock on the wrist. I don't mean you could drop it. I just mean compared to the previously fragile jump hour, this one is everyday wearable. Now, it's a 46 millimeter steel case, and you can see it uses a Girard Perigo base, so it has hacking seconds, a four hertz or eight beat per second rate. You've got your retrograde date, you've got your jump hour, you've got your center seconds, and then if you want to jump the hour without losing the minute, there's a, a little pusher on the side that you can use to advance one whole hour and it'll keep track of the minutes while jumping the hour so you don't have to manually advance and lose your timing. I love the golf ball dimple pattern motif on the dial and the fact that there's a metallic superimposed atop that red lacquer base. You have a metallic track for the minutes, a metallic track 
for the date and a wonderful skeletonized, almost punched out style indicator for the minutes. The layers, the color, and the contrast between the metallics and the lacquer on the style absolutely slay me. And again, don't think of it as a Gerald Gent design. Think of it as an early and fantastic expression. Fabulous in every sense. Fabulous in the sense that Elton John would understand the term. This is a watch I could wear every day with a smile. It's it's crazy. It's like Elton John's shoes, if you remember his shoes from Tommy. Did anyone else see that? Not the whole opera video form? Am I the only one? I hope not, please. Tell me in the chat box I'm not the only one. You'll also note the name of the brand, Gerald Gent ghosted across the crystal. Absolutely sensational. I love this watch. I also love Tommy. The Who's Tommy? Look it up, kids, on, on YouTube. I'm sure it's out there. Okay. I think this is a watch that is so me. I'm seriously thinking of buying it. Let's do a wrist shot. 46 millimeters, and I got to admit, I love the colors. I love the spirit of it. I love the style. It's a watch that, frankly... I think anticipated the trend towards fun and high horology. And this predated this design, MBNF, so Max can't take full credit for the era in which we live. Okay. Bump a bump. Okay. Bump a bump. Captain Zed saying he was playing the Tommy recently. If you're wondering about the section with Elton John, it's the pinball face off, and he plays the pinball wizard who gets defeated by Tommy. Okay, jumping into the world of big and bronze, IWC was late to the game. I'm going to be honest, they're playing catch up because Panerai invented this segment. Okay, this is a big watch. On my wrist, you can see 46 millimeters is just crazy. And in bronze, this is maybe not an all-the-time watch. Richard Hobring commented on the original versions of this watch, saying that the reference 5,000 movement inside the first of the big pilots was designed to be worn two days a week. As a result, people wearing it every day caused the watch to run 15 to 20 seconds fast every single day. Well, IWC's finally gotten a handle on that, so although the style might not be every day, the movement absolutely is. One key distinction. This is a timepiece that has a distinctly vintage flair, a bronze case, and absolutely no connection to history. There was never a B or, or a pilot's watch or a historic IWC that looked like this. This is a watch in titanium and bronze that is all about fun. Yes, it's a limited edition of 1500. I don't find that particularly limited. What's important is that everything syncs up. The bolted, oversized, folded profile strap, the matte black of the dial, the simulated patina coloration of the numerals and the indices, which perfectly matches the bronze of the case. This is a watch very much like the Gerald Genta. It is a fabulous, fantastic, over-the-top, and in my opinion, a somewhat extroverted timepiece. But think about it. This is a manufactured product from a great brand. If it's between this and an Hublot, I don't doubt Hublot. They have an impressive manufacturer, but this has a little bit more integrity and staying power. I would go with this. Okay, big and bold and not colored gold. Let's talk about something from Panerai that came out last year that I adore. Now, I love green. Uh, you can see right here, we've got a couple of different greens on the table. The fantastic metallic green of the Gerald Genta, and more of a sort of neo-olive drab on the Panerai. Now, this is the PAM 737. Technically, it is the Luminor 1950 Chrono Monopulsante 8-Day GMT Titanio, which is to say it's a lot of stuff crammed into a 44-millimeter titanium case, and it's a distinctly different green from the Genta. You know I like things that are kind of loud and proud, and here's the green of my swatch. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's talk about the Panerai. This was by far the most exclusive of three boutique models that debuted in 2017. 200 pieces of this one, so it's a scarcity. I do consider 200 to be a fairly limited edition. For Limited editions, I say 200 and fewer, or sufficiently few that you don't see many of them listed as real inventory on pre-owned sites. This is the first one I've seen. Now, 8-day power reserve, manual winding, manufacturer caliber 2004, it has a few tricks up its sleeve. Column wheel, vertical clutch chronograph, 8-day reserve, mono pusher action, and we may as well start the chronograph so you can see some of that mono pusher action in play. Let me, there we go. Now you can see it does have a second time zone. There's an indicator 
that is coaxial with the normal hour hand, and then there's an AM PM that is coaxial with the constant seconds. One of the features I love about the 2000 series, aside from the fact that they are monstrously over-engineered, if you look at the constant seconds, they feature a zero reset hacking system. So just as I was saying the Zenith Retro Timer can be used as a zero reset system to synchronize your watch since the chronograph is running full time, so too can you zero reset this Panerai Luminor. Now I'll also say the Zenith is 100 meters water resistant and so is this, but I trust this a whole lot more because it has the Panerai locking crown guard. Now these days the crown guard is way deluxe. There's actually a bearing called the runner in the locking cam, but the system is as logical today as it was when it first debuted in the 1950s, which is to say you have a 180 degree full crescent crown guard, so it's very hard to damage the stem tube assembly, and then you also have the ability to just unlock the crown. So if you wish to wind it or if you wish to set it, you can do so without having to thread the crown out. There you can see the second time zone moving along. And it is a 12 hour second time zone hand. You know whether you're looking at day or night by virtue of the AM PM indicator. Sandwich dial, simulated patina, radium style loom. So in other words, it's designed to evoke the look of vintage radium patina on a mid-century Panerai combat watch. This is where we have to talk about that irony, that absurdity, the fact that this is more of an expression of personal flamboyance and irreverence for technology than any actual need. No one needs a watch inspired by combat watches with a retail price of $25,000 and rose gold hands. The things just don't mix like water and oil. That said, this watch and your wrist will make a wonderful tandem as even on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, this 44 wears easily. Now in titanium, it's feather light. And possibly my favorite feature other than the green dial is the fact that it has a bubble-like profile. It is a sapphire, it's not a plexiglass, but darned if it doesn't have the same off-axis effect as a plexiglass. This is a charming watch. It's the kind of watch that at 25 grand doesn't quite make sense, but thanks to the miracle of pre-owned, this is totally logical and right up my alley. I like this a lot. Jumping back to, gee, wow, we're moving fast. Let's talk about two in blue, mostly steel blue dials from the ultimate rivalry, Rolex and Omega. Now this is where you have to really ask, what do I prefer? Do I prefer going with something that's very bound by tradition, traditionally sized, traditionally proportioned, tied to an age old model line, date just. This is the 116234 white gold fluted bezel and steel case on Jubilee bracelet. It does feature a roulette date. So though the evens are black, the odds are red. Do you go with something very traditional or do you go with the new Newer, I should say, Seamaster Aquaterra. Now, this is a 36, this is a 41.5, this is a 31.35, this is a 60 hour coaxial 8500. So there's a big feature delta, but this has already stood the test of time. This has already been redesigned. If you've seen the 2017 to present Aquaterras, you know that Omega has abandoned this case profile, this dial this movement, even the location of the date. The two watches represent different philosophies. That which is eternal and enduring and never subject to planned obsolescence, and that which is modern, attempting to be chic, perhaps attempting to be more of our time. I'm not saying either one of these watches isn't gonna look just as good in the year 2050, but it's gonna appeal to traditionalists or perhaps those who are willing to take a chance. I think they'll both look good. Ultimately, this comes down to whether you're an Omega or Rolex fanboy, and whether you just prefer the bigger look of the Teak Deck Profile Aquaterra 41.5 or the traditional 36 of the Datejust. May as well do wrist shots of the two. Okay, now Aquaterra at 41.5 is hardly an oversized watch. This is an everyday surf turf Omega, no rotating bezel, nice and slim at 13.5. This is a watch you can wear easily without appearing like you're about to go on a Comex expedition. It's bigger than the Rolex, however, and that makes it distinctly more masculine in the contemporary sense. I can't see this at 41.5 becoming a unisex option. I can, however, see the Rolex being that. So let's take a quick look at the Rolex and get a sense of whether or not this is your style 
or whether perhaps you're more of a mind to choose the Omega. Now, I will say this. Of the two, even though I am an Omega man, I'd probably choose the Rolex just because I love the combination of the steel, the white gold, the fluted bezel, and the blue sunburst style. The roulette date is also extraordinary, and nothing matches the comfort of the Jubilee, except maybe a mesh bracelet. This is a wonderful timepiece, and although it might be petite on a wrist below, or on a wrist larger than 17 centimeters, for me, I think this is just about perfect. This is the one I'd pick of the two. Now, finally, I promised you I would conclude with a Z, and I will. Going out with a bang, this is the Circa Basel World 2015 Zenith Pilot Type 20 Extra Special. No, conclusively, not a Salita caliber. This is an Elite Caliber 679. Beneath the image of the Blerio monoplane that crossed the English Channel is a Elite 679, 26 joules, automatic winding, 50 to 55 hour power reserve. And yes, I've measured the crown at 12.2 millimeters in diameter. It is bigger than the crown on a big pilot. Now, features I like here. The numerals are actually solid applied blocks of Luminova. So they're not printed on, they are applied. But if you look at them, they have they actually have height, they have depth, they have three dimensions to them, and it's a beautifully assembled dial when you get closer to it. And that's a rarity in oversized watches, which are generally calculated for a white knuckle, in your face, I, I might even say somewhat aggressive stance on the wrist. Generally, they're designed to make a statement at a distance. This is one of the few that holds up under scrutiny at close range. And maybe that's just the signature of Zenith, which always, has always done things the right way. Zenith, a brand that I love second only to Jugere Le Coult, was late to the party in the big pilot and the bronze market segments. But this is a memorable piece, and I absolutely love it. And by the way, the loom shot is sensational. 45 millimeters. Guys, thank you for joining tonight. I absolutely thank all of you for joining. You guys make the best job on earth possible for me. I want to thank my crew. Uh, some of them have been fighting through colds here, and I appreciate them for making the effort. We got to run because we're getting some tech work done on the studio. But thank you all for joining. And remember, if you're watching this recorded, go to the description box and enter our raffle to win the Audi GMT from Oris. It's a great piece, and I'm throwing in a free Oris field compass that's worth 50 bucks by itself. A total value of 2500 Thank you so much. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.